All right. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. My name is John Bodner. Um, I'm a software engineer. I currently work at Capital One um, as a distinguished engineer. It's sort of like a staff engineer role at many other companies. And I've been speaking and writing about Go for several years now. Some of you may have seen some of my talks or read one of my blog posts. Um, so this March, O'Reilly released my new book, Learning Go. As the subtitle says, it's meant to be an idiomatic approach to Go, which means the book tries to encourage you to write Go code that takes advantage of Go's features as the community has figured them out over the past decade or so. Uh, as it explains features, Learning Go tries to teach you how you should best use the features. It covers up to Go 116, although a couple of changes came in a bit too late to make it into the book. Uh, first part of the book covers the basics of the language, but there are chapters on some more involved topics as well. There's one on the context, another on reflection, unsafe, and Seago, one on packages and modules, one on how pointers work and how to best use them, another chapter on testing. I was even able to get a chapter that covers the upcoming generic support in 118. Uh, dozens of code samples, most of which are available either on the Go Playground or on GitHub. Digital edition and print edition of the book are available now. And as Sujith mentioned, um, I will be giving my copies of Learning Go to some lucky attendees. And at the end of the talk, I'll also put up a link that will give you access for 30 days to the book on O'Reilly Learning. And before you ask, uh, the animal on the cover is a pocket gopher. I, I know it looks a little bit like a mole, but they're very different animals. Pocket gophers are herbivores and moles only code in JavaScript. So a few years ago, I recorded a video course called Learn Go in three hours. And it's a basic introduction to the language that covers as much as I could in about three and a half hours. Now, Unfortunately, we don't have three hours today, so let's try an even shorter version. We're going to do Learn Go in 30 minutes. Now, I promise you I'm going to leave stuff out, but I will try to hit the highlights and I'll give you a taste of what it's like to write a Go program, show you why I think Go is a good choice for building services. So Go was developed by engineers at Google over the past decade to kind of solve the problems that Google has. Google is built on top of services running across tens of thousands of computers and data centers all around the world. And because Google is huge, their loads are enormous. So using those resources as efficiently as possible is really important. And it's also essential that it's easy to deploy your updates to your code. So in addition, Ken Thompson, Rob Pike, and Rob Grishamer, they were tired of waiting hours for C++ builds to complete. And they really hated C++ as a language because it was just too complicated to use well. You know, source code gets written by people once, but it's read by people many, many times. So making sure that your code is easy to follow is really important for future maintenance. So these guys spent a couple of years designing a language that would meet all these needs. And in 2009, they introduced Go. So let's start with setting up your Go environment. First, you need to get the Go build tools. You go to golang.org slash DL, click the link for the installer for your platform. There's double clickable installers for Mac and Windows. For Linux, it's the tar GZ file, you just expand, and then link to the path in the bin directory inside of that expanded directory. Um, and that installs the standard Go library and Go development tools. And there's a lot of stuff in there by default. You get a compiler, a profiler, a linter, a code formatter, test and benchmark runner, package manager, and more. But the one that I really want to call out is the code formatter, Go Fumpt. FMT is pronounced Fumpt in, in Go world. Uh, rather than rely on arguments to determine how code should be laid out, Go has this built-in formatter that you're expected to run on your code. And it's been said that the, that the format that Go Fumpt requires is no one's favorite format. But Go Fumpt is everyone's favorite tool because it ends all of the dumb arguments over the number of spaces and locations of braces that you deal with in other languages. And next, you'll need an IDE development environment. And if you're a hardcore hacker, you can use VI, and there are tools to add Go aware syntax checking to VI. But for mere mortals like me, uh, there are two popular options. I switch back and forth between them, actually. Uh, the first is from JetBrains. You can use either IntelliJ Ultimate or they've also packaged the Go tools into their own IDE called Goland. Uh, it's not free, but like all of JetBrains tools, they are very good at what they do. Uh, the other option is Visual Studio Code. I assume everyone here is using VS Code already. If not, the free open source editor from Microsoft that runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Huge plugin ecosystem, including plugins to support writing your code with Go. If you haven't already installed it, you can go to codevisualstudio.com slash download, download the version for your platform, and then get the Go plugin as well. So let's start with everyone's favorite first program, Hello World. But we're going to do this a little bit differently. We're going to write a web server that returns Hello World when you connect to it. And so you see the code on screen. You can put this code into a file called hello world.go, maybe directory hello world. On the command line, you just type go build. After a second or two, you have to get a binary. Go compiles to a single binary. And then you run this binary, and your server's up and running. And you can just hit it with curls or whatever, and 
you'll return back a request. So let's go through this program and see what each line does. The first line of every Go source file is a package declaration, and we'll talk more about them later, but all Go programs start from a package called main. The next set of lines imports a library from the standard library into your program. So we're importing the net slash HTTP package into our, into our code. And this package provides a production quality HTTP2 client and server. And one of the nice things about writing services in Go is having things like this available from the Go team directly. Next, we declare our main function. So all Go programs start from a function called main in the main package. We declare a function with the keyword func, the name of the function, and then parentheses that contain the input parameters to the function. And there are no input parameters, so you have empty parentheses. And when a function returns a value, the value is listed after the parentheses. Again, main doesn't return back a value, so nothing is there. Next, you have the body of the function. So the first thing we're doing in this function is we're calling the handle func function in the HTTP package. Notice that when we use the code imported from another package, we prefix the function or variable or type with the name of the package that we're using. So this handle func function registers a request handling function with the built-in request dispatcher. And we're gonna pass two arguments to handle func. The first is a string with a, the path that we're gonna listen on. And the second is a function that handles the requests. And we're just declaring this function inline. Go has first class functions as a type. And these inline functions don't have a name, but you have the, the keyword func, and then you have the, the parameters for it in parentheses. And this function has two parameters. The first has the name RW, and, and the parameters of type HTTP response writer. The second one is named req and is type pointer to HTTP request. We're, we're gonna talk about pointers in a bit. So in the body of our function, we call the write method on the rw variable and we pass it the string hello world. So the write method doesn't know how to handle a string. All it can do is take a slice of bytes. And we'll talk about slices, but a slice, think of it like a list in many other programming languages. And Go has built in support for converting a string into a slice of bytes. So we do that, we convert our string to a slice of bytes pass it to the right method on RW. And that's the end of this inner function. And then finally, back in our main function, we call the listen and serve function in the HTTP package, pass it the port we're listening on, which is 8080, and then we pass a nil. Nil in Go is like nil or none or null in other languages, just means a variable has no value. So in this case, when you pass a nil for that second parameter to listen and serve, it means we're gonna use the built-in request dispatcher. Our server starts up, the program's ready to handle requests. So that's it, we've seen a Go program that does something, but that was pretty quick. Some parts are probably pretty fuzzy right now. Don't worry, we'll go through all the features of the language and get a better grasp of what's going on here. Start with variables and built-in types. Go has all the expected number types, ints and 8, 16, 32, and 64 bits, signed and unsigned, along with 32-bit and 64-bit floats. There's a couple of built-in type aliases too. So a byte is an unsigned 8-bit integer value, same thing as a uint8. Int is interesting. It's either assigned 60, either assigned 64-bit integer or assigned 32-bit integer. And whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit depends on the native int size on the CPU that, you're compile, that you compiled your code for. Um, there's also a built-in bool type with two values, true and false. Um, number types are all the usual number operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulus various bit shifting and twiddling operators that we've come to expect from languages in the C family. And now we know about the types of variables, let's talk about declaring types. So Go has several different declaration formats. The longest one is a var declaration with a type. And so here we're declaring a variable x to be an integer with the value 10. Remember that size of x is to be 32-bit or 64-bit, depending on your platform's int size. We have the keyword var, the variable's name, then the variable's type, then equals, and the value. And if it's clear from the right-hand side of the equal sign what the type is going to be, Go has type inference. You can just leave off the type. And so quick aside, um, what do you think will happen if you try to add a float and an int together? So what do you think Z is going to be? So this is actually a trick question. This produces an error at compile time. Go won't let you add an int to a float. You get a message that says invalid operation X plus Y, mismatch types int and float. Go doesn't automatically promote types, not even different sized ints. So this prevents all sorts of underflow and overflow errors that come up in C and Java. If, if you want to work with variables of different types, you have to do a type conversion explicitly to, on one of those one of your variables. So anyway, a couple of remaining var details. If you want your variable to be set to the zero value, you can leave off the equal sign on the right side to specify the variable name and the type. And you can also define multiple variables at once using var. 
Go also has a colon equals operator that gives an even shorter way to define and assign a, a value to a variable. Just like var, use colon equals to define and assign multiple variables at once. And colon equals has one other trick, which is that not, not all of the variables on the left-hand side have to be new. As long as one variable on the left-hand side is new, you can use colon equals and it will define and assign all the new variables, but just assign a value to any of the existing ones. And we saw a string in our sample web server and string is a built-in type in Go also. So you can define a, a string in Go can be delimited in one of two different ways. You can use double quotes to create a normal string and in a normal string, you can escape reserved and invisible characters using a backslash. So here we have a backslash N for a new line or a hello world string. A raw string though uses back ticks to mark the start and end of a string. It can contain anything except another back tick. Nothing is escaped. Everything is stored just how you wrote it. So there's another way to put a new line into your code, into a string. And you can find the length of a string using the built-in len function. And you can pull a substring out of a string using a starting and ending offset. And finally, you can also pull out a single entry in a string using a subscript. But what you're pulling out is a little bit surprising. So in addition to the string built-in type, there's also a character built-in type in Go called a rune. A rune is 32 bits, it's unsigned, and represents a Unicode code point. So not enough time to go into all the things Unicode today. That's a whole huge other talk. But a character can be composed of one or more code points, which if you're up in all your Unicode lingo is technically called a grapheme cluster. And so you might think that a string would be built out of runes, but that's not the case in Go. In Go, a string is built out of bytes. When you get the length of a string with the built-in function len, that returns the number of bytes in the string, not the number of runes or characters. So when you take a substring or refer to an index in a string, that's also in bytes. And this is a little bit surprising, but there are practical reasons for it. And there are ways to work with strings as collections of characters. And we'll see those in just a bit. So there's lots of support for UTF-8 in Go, which is not surprising since Ken Thompson and Rob Pike, two of the creators of Go, they also invented UTF-8. And we'll see some of that UTF support later. The important thing to remember is that if you will ever have non-ASCII characters in a string, you must make sure that you do the right thing. So you might be wondering, we've seen, we've seen variables declared with a var and variables declared with type inference. And that's kind of similar to var declarations in lots of other languages. But what about let declarations? Does Go have constants? And the answer is not really. Go does have a const keyword, which you give a name to a literal value or to an expression that's entirely composed of literal values. But you can't use it for anything else. You can't make a constant structure or slice or map. And you can't use a constant for a primitive type if there's a variable on the right-hand side of the assignment. One last thing to mention about variables in Go, you aren't allowed to have unused variables in your functions. If you declare a variable, even if you assign the variable a value, but you never read that variable's value, that is a compile time error. So that, that's pretty much everything about assigning variables and declaring them in Go. Let's move on to something a little bit more interesting like control structures. So Go has if else statements, should not be a surprise. You don't put parentheses around the if condition and the braces are required. Go has block scope. So you can declare new variables inside of the if or else blocks and they cease to exist when that block ends. But Go into something else also. One interesting thing that Go lets you do is declare a variable before the if condition and then use that variable in the blocks of both the if and the else clauses. So here we defined A as part of the if statement. And that A will cease to exist after the if and else clauses end. Go also unsurprisingly has for loops. What might be surprising is that Go only has a single looping keyword, for. And you can use for in an old school C style for loop. And just like C and all the languages based on it, you have the initialization, the comparison, and the increment. Again, braces are required for the body of your for loop, and there's no parentheses around all the parts of the for conditions. But you don't have to include all the parts. You can simulate a while loop in a lot of other languages by just leaving off the initialization and the increment. And instead of writing while true, you can just loop forever, but it's typing for. And so this program here would run basically for forever. Uh, you can use the keyword break to exit a loop early, and the keyword continue skips over the rest of the lines in the loop, goes back to the top, calls the increment and the condition if they exist. And I'm not going to show this today, but you can break out of nested loops by using labels. And there's one more thing that for loops can do. They can range over certain built-in types. Remember how strings were indexed by bytes? Well, if you want to walk through each Unicode character in a string, each rune in a string, you do so with a for range loop. So the range returns two values for each iteration through the loop. The first is the position in bytes in the string. 
And the second is the value at that position as a rune. So we have our string, hello, comma, globe, emoji, exclamation point. And let's see what happens if you run this code. Um, for all, all the code, all the runes, you get the position, the value in Unicode, and the text representation of the rune. So rune is a 32-bit number. So you have to turn that into a Unicode character. You cast it to a string before printing it. And what you see here is UTF-8 in action. So the globe emoji starts at byte number seven, the eighth position. Exclamation points at position 11. That's because um, positions zero through six, they all fit into one byte in UTF-8. But the emoji takes four bytes in UTF-8, which means the next, char next character in the string, the exclamation points at position 11. So there's other built-in types that can use the full range loop. We'll get back to those in a bit. Next control structure that Go has is switch statements. And this is very similar to switch statements in many other languages. If you're used to the switch statement in C, the switch keyword improves on the version in C quite a bit. Let you specify multiple values to match a single case. Doesn't require an explicit break to stop cases from falling through when there's a match. And you can match on anything that's comparable, not just on numbers. If you do want this C-like behavior, you can put the keyword fall through as a last line of code within a case. So in this example with n equal to one, we'll print out two lines, n less than equal to three and less than n less than or equal to six. Just like an if statement, a switch statement lets you define a variable that's only in scope for the switch's cases. So here we're defining x for just to exist inside the switch cases. x is n divided by two or five, and this will print out x is less than or equal to six. So Go has an interesting variation on a switch called a blank switch. If you don't specify a value for the switch to match on, each case instead is a Boolean condition. And the first one that matches is the one that's used. So in this example, we'll print out multiple of five because our case we check for n mod five equals zero happens first before our n mod two equals zero case, which checks if it's even. And that's all the control structures you get in Go, if, for, and switch. So let's look at functions. Uh, we've seen a little bit of functions already back in our web server example. Use the keyword func to start a function, like I said before, the name, the input parameters, and the output parameters. We put the variable name before the variable type for input parameters, and you return values with the return statements. And I said values plural, and that wasn't a mistake. Go lets you return multiple values from a function. So the function returns, this function here returns a result of dividing and modding two ints. Some languages do something similar. They have a tuple that returns from a function, but Go doesn't have tuples. When you get back multiple values from a function, each is assigned to its own variable. And as you saw on our web server, Go lets you declare anonymous functions inside functions, and those functions are closures. They can refer to and modify values in that outer function. And some languages require you to mark your closures with special syntax. Go doesn't do that. Any function declared with another function is automatically a closure. Uh, notice that our anonymous function refers not only to the A and B that are passed into it, but also refers to the base variable declared inside of main. And if you ran this program, it'll print out 600 because it multiplies 20 times 3 times 10. You can also write functions that return functions, which can be assigned to variables called higher order functions. And this program here, adder returns back a function that adds on the number that was passed in. So running this program will print out 12 and 13 as we create two different adders. So ghost functions are very powerful, but there are a couple of things you might miss from other languages. So there aren't any name parameters in Go. Also, there isn't any function overloading. Every function's name must be unique within its package. So Go is also a call by value language. And what that means is every time you pass a value to a function, a copy of that value is sent to the function. So in this sample here, when we have a equals 10 in main and we pass that a to the function double, and then we change the value inside of double, the value of a isn't changed back in main. If you run this program, it prints out 10. But sometimes you have a really big structure you want, that you don't want to copy, or maybe you want to write a function that does modify one of its parameters. So what do you do? Well, in Go, you use pointers. And Go follows C's convention for pointers. Use an ampersand to get the reference to a pointer to a variable, and use an asterisk to indicate that a type is a pointer type, and use an asterisk also with a variable to dereference, or which means that you want to refer to the variable that's pointed to by the pointer. So in our example here, this new double function has a parameter that's named a of type pointer to int. And when we modify the value that points to it by dereferencing a, and then multiply its value by two. And when we call double in main now, we use an ampersand to get a pointer that references a. And when you run this program, it prints out 20 because we're referring back to the original a. So be aware that a pointer parameter is still past call by value. The difference is the value that you're copying is the memory location of the data, not the data itself. 
Now I talk about pointers, everyone gets scared. How, once you have pointers, you start wondering, how do you handle memory in Go? And the answer is that you don't. Go is a garbage collected language. Memory gets allocated automatically as you need it. It's freed when there's no more live references to it. The Go garbage collector is designed to very short, short pause times, like microseconds short, even with very large heaps. This keeps responses very consistent. All right, so what else is there in Go? Go has two built-in container types, slices and maps. We've already seen slices back in our web server example. A slice is a sequential list of values that can grow. You declare a slice just like any other variable, but with the open closed brackets in front of the type. So here we declared a slice named A of type slice of int. We add items to a slice using the built-in append function. And um, here we see the append function in use. We can print out a slice's contents by passing it to println. You get a length of a slice with a built-in function len, just like we saw for strings. Also like strings, use a subscript to pull out a single value from a slice, or use a range to pull out a slice from an existing slice. Just like strings, you can use a slice in a four range loop. The first variable is the index in the slice. Second variable is the value at that index. And Go also has a built-in map type, similar to dictionary or dict or mapped in other types or hash, hash tables in other languages. We declare our map A here with the keyword map, the type of the key in brackets and the type of the value after the brackets. So here we made a map of strings to ints. The braces at the end make a new map. We then put some values into the map. The left side of the equal sign has the map and the key in, the key in brackets. The right side of the equal sign has the value for that key. We can print out the map. We use built-in len function to find the number of key value pairs in the map. And just like strings and slices, you use the range keyword with the map to get all of the keys and value pairs in the map. And we read from a map using the map and the key in brackets. And you remove items from a map with the built-in delete function. But if you try to read a key from the map and that key is not defined, you get back the zero value or the default value for a type. And for a number, the zero value is zero. For a string, it's an empty string. Now, since zero is a legal value, how do you know when the key is missing and when it's been assigned the zero, when there's a key in there that's been assigned the zero value? And so go with a special trick called a comma okay idiom. When you read a value from the map, you put two variables on the left-hand side. The first variable gets the value for the key. The second gets a Boolean. And that Boolean gets set to true if the key exists in the map and false if it doesn't. So we've seen the built-in compound data types, slices and maps, but what about defining your own data types? So Go has structs, which are used to group together related states. A struct is declared with the keyword type, the name of the struct, and the keyword struct. Inside of your braces, you put a field on each line with the name of the field first, type of the field second. And you can use any type you want, but there's no way to make a field and a struct a constant. Um, on the first line of our main, we initialize a struct with values. If a value isn't provided for a field, then the zero value gets used instead. And you read fields with dot notation, and you can write to fields with dot notation as well. Like the built-in types you saw earlier, a struct is a value type. If you pass a struct to a function, the function is a copy of the struct. But if you want to modify the fields in the struct when you pass it to a function? Well, just like we saw before with the built-in types, you pass a pointer to the struct. So our program here, we declare f of type foo, a is 10, b is pat. We pass it to value foo, which gets a copy of it. And if we modify a inside that copy, we print it out, we'll get out after value foo, 10 and pat. We pass, point, we pass our f to our pointer foo, we pass a pointer to it, we modify that field in there, and then it will print out after pointer foo, 20 and pat. So you can define methods on structs in Go. Rather than, than define the method name inside of the, um, so most languages when you have a method, you have it inside the braces for the, for the type definition. Go doesn't do that. Method definitions in Go look a lot like function definitions. The only difference is that before, between the word func and the name of the function, you have that little receiver section with the variable name and the type. And there's no implicit self in Go. You use that name provided in the parentheses to refer to your instance within the method. So we've seen structs, so you might be wondering about classes. Well, Go doesn't have classes and it doesn't have inheritance either. There's no way to make one concrete type in Go a subtype of another concrete type, but it does have some things to replace inheritance. First is built-in delegation support. This is, this is kind of cool. I don't think there's anything in any other language like this. So in our example here, we're at this unnamed field of type foo inside of type bar. And this is called embedding foo inside of bar. And this lets you access all of the items declared on foo directly on an instance of bar. So you can call b.a in this code here, and you get the value of the a field in foo. 
we can call the method less than on a bar instance and get that same behavior, even though less than was defined on foo. So this gives you the ability to compose types together, which is a much preferred pattern today. But notice that bar is still not a foo. If you tried to pass bar to a function that expects a foo, that's a compile time error. If you wanted to do that, you have to pull the foo explicitly out of bar and pass that in instead. Go also has an abstract data type called an interface. So an interface defines one or more methods that a type must implement in order to meet the interface. So write the word type, the name of the interface, and the word interface. Instead of braces, you list the methods that we expect on the types that meet the interface. If you ever did a protocol in Objective-C, it's kind of similar to that. So remember implementation of foo from a couple of slides back? This one here? So look at this, right? Nothing on here says that it implements lesser. But yeah, you can pass an instance of foo to the print lesser function and it'll work. And that's because in Go, interfaces are implicit, not explicit. A type automatically meets an interface anytime it implements all of the interface's methods. And here's where the delegation kicks in. We have foo embedded in bar. We can pass bar into print lesser as well because that embedded foo meets the lesser interface. So bar by embedding, by embedding foo also meets the interface as well. So this implicit behavior of interfaces seems like a small detail, but it really changes how you work with abstract types. In most languages with abstract types, you define them alongside the concrete implementation. So I can go in, in Java, for example, you define a concrete type and have an interface that, that implements it and they're defined in the same package. But in Go, it's the code that uses the implementation that defines the interface that it needs. So there's a saying in the Go community, accept interfaces return structs. And one reason why is that it, this allows you to have different implementations passed in that meet the needs of your code. Hmm. Okay, so now we get to Go's most famous feature, concurrency support. Concurrency is built into Go, and let's see here's a small sample of it. So Go's concurrency is built around channels and Go routines. On the first line in our main here, we're creating a new channel which can hold ints. Use a make function and pass the keyword chan and the type of the data. And you can think of a channel as a queue and a goroutine as a thread. It's not quite true, but you can think of it that way. Next, we're going to write, we're going to start, we're going to start 10 goroutines in this for loop. To start a goroutine, all you do is call a function and put the keyword go in front of it. So in this example here, we're creating closures that take the value that's passed in i, multiply it by two, and then write that value to that channel ch. And after each goroutine does that, it exits. So back in main, we loop over the channel 10 times, reading a value from the channel and then printing it on screen. And if you ran this code, what you'll see is that the numbers come back in a random order because the goroutines all get scheduled in a random order. Now, reading from a channel, it blocks until there's a value to be read. Or if you write to a channel, it blocks until that value is read as well. So maybe you want to read from multiple channels at once or write to multiple channels at once. So in that case, you use what's called a select statement. So here's a sample function we're starting with. We declare a function called writer that takes in a number and a channel for numbers. And in writer, we loop 10 times and write multiples of the number to the channel. In main, we're gonna make two channels and launch two go routines, one with a one and ch1 passed to writer, another one with two and ch2 passed to writer. And then in main, we read from both channels using a select, which looks quite a bit like that blank switch we saw earlier. Each case in the select is a read or write to the channel. And the interesting thing about select is that if there are two channels that have the values ready to be read or written, it picks the channel to read or write at random. And this prevents deadlock that, that would be caused if you always went from the top down. And so if you ran this program, this would the outputs from CH1 and CH2 are interspersed as the select statement randomly picks which channel to read. So putting together your concurrent applications using go routines and channels and selects is just as powerful as a standard model where threads acquire locks and shared pieces of data but it's a lot easier to reason about. So I'm just connecting pipes together. A lot more details to working with concurrency in Go. You can find them in my book or from lots of other resources. I mentioned earlier that Go has a large standard library full of useful features for writing servers. In addition to the built-in HTTP client and server, there's built-in JSON XML support, image generation, file IO, networking libraries, math libraries, random number generators, cryptography libraries, sorting, time and date handling, SQL support, compression, Unicode support. I mentioned earlier that even though Go strings were built with bytes under the covers, there was still strong support for Unicode. Standard library is where you find it. UTF-8, there's a set of functions to validate and convert between strings and bytes and runes. There's UTF-16 support in the UTF-16 package, and there's even more Unicode support in the Unicode package. 
Let me show you quickly how JSON support works in Go. So here we're going to import two packages from the standard library. The fump package, which prints to the screen, we've been using that import, we've been importing that all along, and the encoding JSON package, which works with JSON. The fields in our foo struct, you see there's the strings declared after them. Those are called struct tags, and they provide some metadata for the JSON library tools to know how to associate JSON to the structs fields. And to turn JSON into a struct, we create a variable of type foo. S is, uh, uses raw, is a raw string that has some JSON in it. We then call the unmarshal function in the JSON package, pass it the string converted to a slice of bytes, and a pointer to that foo instance. This returns back an error. We'll talk about errors in a little bit. Um, to go back from a struct to a string, we call the marshal function in the JSON package, passing it our instance of foo, and this returns back a slice of bytes and an error. Convert that slice of bytes back to a string, and you get back the same JSON that was passed in. We should cover third-party libraries also. So the standard library includes a lot of functionality. There's still plenty of functionality provided by third-party libraries. We've been importing packages from the standard library using the import statement, and the same thing is used for third-party dependencies also. So here's a simple program that uses a third-party library to do foreign language detection. You see the import of the getlang library. You specify using the location of its source code in GitHub. Go builds things from source. And we use the public function from string in our getlang package. We prefix the from string function call with the name of the package, just like we do when using something from the standard library. Now, before we use the third-party dependency in Go, we have to get it. So Go is a standard system for managing third-party dependencies called mod. Let you initialize a project, store your dependency version information in a file called go.mod. And when you first create a project, use a command go mod init and the source repository path for your project. And this creates here a go mod file in our directory that gives a unique name for our module. Then when you add new third party libraries to your program, you specify that it's being used in the code with the import statement. And then you go to the command line, you're in the command go mod tidy. And this downloads a library as well as any other libraries that the library depends on all in source code, and adds the entries to our go.mod file, generates another file called go.sum, which contains SHA-1s of the third-party libraries. By doing this, it keeps you from someone poisoning the well and putting an invalid library up there. And here's what's in the go.mod file. Um, not very much, the require section list your dependencies. Then you build with go.build, like we talked about before. All your third-party code gets compiled into that same single binary. Go does not use shared libraries at, at all. Um, now that we have our dependencies, you can just build and run your code. And all the code we've written so far is in the main package, but Go, you can write your own packages as well. You group your related code into a package. Um, making your own package is pretty easy. You just put the code into a different directory, put a package declaration at the top of the file. And let's go back to our language translation sample we just saw, break it into packages. So here's our greeting code from before, but now it's in its own package. You can see package greeting at the top. And here's how we call it for main. Notice that the import that refers to the code, it's the full path to our greeting package, including the github.com stuff. So you might be wondering, how do you control what types and functions and variables are exposed to other packages? Go uses a very simple system. If the first letter in the name of a type or function or variable is a capital letter, it's visible outside of this package. It's called exporting, but it's the same concept as public in many other languages. If the first letter is lowercase, it's only visible inside the package. That's it. So if you're wondering why all of the imported functions and types are capitalized, that's why. So that's Go. Um, lots, there's some details, some little used features I skipped over, but really the basic language is very small and simple. And you have all these simple parts. What makes Go a great language to work in is that it is simple. And there are a lot of things provided by other languages. And it turns out though, they don't really help you all that much when you actually write code. Now, I'm not saying that they're bad features, but I'm saying that in practice, they turn, they turn out to be inessential. And arguably, some of them even reduce the ability to onboard new developers or have a productive code review. Um, if any of you ever worked in Scala, Scala has this known problem where different people use different parts of the language and oftentimes have a very hard time understanding each other's code. So I can honestly say I have not missed having inheritance at all. Implicit interfaces and delegation via type embedding, amply sufficient. I also don't miss throwing errors. We'll do a deep dive into how Go handles errors in just a couple of minutes. Like the rest of Go, it's simpler, a little bit more verbose, but easier to understand and maintain. And there are a few things that I do kind of wish were present in Go. I didn't mention Go influence enum because they aren't very powerful. Well, I'll see an example though in a bit. It would be nice if Go used some types implement enums like Rust and Swift and some of the other recent languages do. And optionals in those languages are a special case of enums. Again, kind of wish they were in Go. 
Goes immutability story, not great. Um, it's called by value and value type solves some of the problems, but there's some situations where you pass around pointers still, and there's no way to say, don't modify this. Uh, it's strange a little bit in Go because Go has concurrency and, pro and concurrent programs have problems with mutable state, but Go instead uses tools like the race detector to find cross Go routine mutability. And, and I have to mention generics. This has been the great debate since Go was first released. There is a proposal, it's been accepted, being polished right now, expected to be included in Go 118 that's due in February, 2022. Now, overall, I think that Go's trade-offs make a lot of sense. It's very intentionally small and pragmatic language. And by making the language simple and fast, you get this good trade-off between developer productivity and performance. Sometimes it would be nice to have a couple other features that are present in more complicated languages. Most of the time, you find you get along fine without them. Now, having seen Go, what makes it so suited for writing servers? So there are a few things. First, it's a simple language, easy to pick up. And we really cover like 80% of the language in 30 minutes. Next, standard library includes many things that are needed for server development. After that, Go compiles to native code, and it does not require a large runtime. So Go binaries, they fit very nicely into very small Docker containers. Oftentimes, you use a scratch container with a Go binary. Go's concurrency features make it really easy to write microservices that split up tasks, call it the microservices, have timeouts, and all the stuff's designed to fit together. The, the garbage collection, the concurrency, the networking code, they're all tuned to work together. And it ensures that your performance for your services written in Go is very consistent. Don't get spikes when garbage collection happens. And consistent performance is really important for a server. Okay. So that was a whirlwind tour through Go. Uh, let me see if um, we had any good questions. Um, uh, let's see. If we, we, we keep, don't. We, want to keep on going? Yes, yes. All right, let, let's do a deep dive um, through any questions. So we don't have any questions. Yeah, we are still recording. Um, okay. All right, we'll, uh, we'll do the deep dive into errors next, and then we'll talk about some questions. Okay. Um, so this is based on the errors chapter in my book. Um, we'll start with some of the more basic things, move on to some things that are a little bit more interesting. Error is a built-in interface that defines a single method. Anything that influences that interface is considered an error. So what's interesting though, is that other than being built in, there's nothing particularly special about this interface. So let's take a look at a simple Go function. So Go handles errors by returning a value of type error as a last return value for a function. This is entirely by convention, but it's such a strong convention, it should never be breached. When a function executes as expected, you return nil for the error parameter because nil is the zero value for any interface type. But when something goes wrong, an error value gets returned instead. So in this case, we're, turning, we're creating a new error from a string by calling the new function in the errors package. Error messages should not be capitalized, nor should they end with punctuation or a new line. And in most cases, you should set up other return, your other return values to the zero values when a non-nil error is returned. So let's take a look at handling errors. Uh, the calling function checks the error return value by comparing it to nil, handle the error or returns back an error of its own. So unlike languages with exceptions, Go doesn't have any special constructs to detect if an error was returned. Whenever a function returns, we just use an if statement to check if the error variable is set to non-nil. All right, so far so good. Pretty simple and straightforward. If anyone has written Go before, you've done all this stuff since day one of your programs. But developers who are new to Go and used to languages with, with exceptions, they often find errors kind of maddening and primitive. Uh, there are two very good reasons why Go uses returned errors instead of thrown exceptions. First, exceptions add at least one new code path through your code. And those paths are sometimes unclear, especially in languages whose functions don't include a declaration that says an exception is possible, like runtime exceptions in Java or Python, pick your language that doesn't have an exceptions clause on the function declaration. And this produces code that crashes in really surprising ways when exceptions aren't properly handled. Or even worse, you have code that doesn't crash, but the data is not properly initialized or modified or stored. So the second reason is a little bit more subtle, but demonstrates how Go's features all work together. The Go compiler requires that all variables must be read. By making errors which return values, that forces developers to either check and handle the error conditions or make it explicit that they're ignoring errors by using an underscore for the returned error value. So exception handling may produce shorter code, but fewer lines doesn't necessarily make code easier to understand or maintain. And idiomatic Go favors clear code, even if it takes more lines. Another thing to note is how code flows in Go. The error handling is indented inside the if statement. 
The business logic is not. And this gives a quick visual clue as to which code is on the golden path and which code is there to handle errors. And for simple errors, you can just use strings. The Go standard library provides two ways to create an error from a string. The first is the errors new function. It takes in a string, returns an error. And the string is returned when you call the error method on the returned error instance. If you pass in an error to bumped println, it just calls the error method for you automatically. Second way is to use the bumped error f function. And this function allows you all sorts of formatting verbs, um, like print f and c, uh, or format in Java to create an error. And like error is new, the string is returned when you call the error method on the returned error instance. Some errors are meant to signal that processing cannot continue due to a problem with the current state. So in this blog post, don't just check errors, handle them gracefully. Dave Cheney, who's a pretty famous developer in the Go community, he coined the term sentinel errors to describe these. Um, the name descends, he said, from the practice in computer programming of using a specific value to signify that no further processing is possible. So, so too with Go, we use specific values to signify an error. So sentinel errors are one of the few variables that you should declare at the package level. By convention, their name starts with ERR, and they should be treated as read only. There's no way for the Go compiler to enforce this, but it's a programming error to change the value of a sentinel error. So sentinel errors are usually used to indicate that you can't start or continue processing. So for example, the standard library includes a package for processing zip files called archive zip. And this package defines several sentinel errors, including error format, which is returned when data that doesn't represent a zip file is passed in. And here's how you use it. So be sure, before you uh, define a sentinel error for your own code, be sure that you actually need it. Because once you define one, it's part of your public API, and you've committed to be, it being available in all future backwards compatible releases. Now, it's far better to reuse one of the sentinel errors in the standard library, or to define an error type that holds information about the condition that caused the error to be returned. We'll talk about how to do that in just a little bit. But if you have an error condition that indicates a specific state that's been reached in your application where no further processing is possible and no contextual information really needs to be used to explain the error state, a sentinel error is the correct choice. So how do you test for a sentinel error? As you can see in this code sample, you use double equals to test if the error was returned when calling a function whose documentation explicitly states it returns a sentinel error. But later in the talk, we'll discuss how to check for sentinel errors in other situations. And so far, all the errors we've seen are strings, but Go errors can contain more information. Let's see how. Um, since error is an interface, you can define your own errors that include additional information for logging or error handling. So for example, you might want to include a status code as part of the error to indicate the kind of error that should be reported back to the user. And this lets you avoid string comparisons to determine error causes, which is good because the message text might change. So let's see how this all works. Here's an example of the enumerations I didn't talk about earlier. We're using them to represent the status codes. So next, we define a status error struct to hold this value along with a message. And we define an error method on status error so that it meets the error interface. And now we can use status error to provide more details about what went wrong. So even when you define your own custom error types, always use error as the return type for the error result. And this allows you to return different types of errors from your function and allows callers of your function to choose to not depend on the specific error type. Some gotchas when using your own error type. First of all, be sure you don't return an uninitialized instance. So this means you shouldn't declare a variable to be the type of your custom error and then return that variable. So take a look at this code here. We call this generate error function twice. First time we call it, we pass it true, which returns back a not found status error. We then print out if error is not nil. Second time we call generate error, we pass false, which just returns back the uninitialized gen error. And we then print out if that is not nil. So you might be surprised to find out this program prints out true and true. In both cases, error was non-nil. And this is a little bit weird, but the reason why error is non-nil is that error is an interface. And so one of the gotchas in Go is that for an interface to be considered nil, both the underlying type and the underlying value must be nil. When we return a variable of type status error, the underlying value was nil, but the underlying type was non-nil. And there's the reason for this. You can find out about it actually in my book. Um, so there are two ways to fix it. Uh, the most common approach is to explicitly return nil for the error value when a function completes successfully. And this has the advantage of not requiring you to trace through all of your code to make sure the error variable on the return statement was correctly defined. And the other approach is to make sure that any local variable that holds the error is of type error. 
So when an error gets passed back through your code, you often want to add some additional contextual information to it. And this can be the name of the function that received the error or the operation it was trying to perform. And when you preserve an error while adding additional information, this is called wrapping the error. And when you have a series of wrapped errors, this is called an error chain. So there's a function in the Go standard library that wraps errors. We've already seen it. The fumped error f function has a special verb percent %w. And you use this to create an error whose formatted string includes a formatted string of another error, and which also contains the original error as well. So the convention is to write colon space percent %w at the end of the error format string and make the error to be wrapped the last parameter passed to fumped error f. So the standard library also provides a function for unwrapping errors, the unwrap function in the errors package. You pass it an error and returns the wrapped error if there is one. If there isn't, it returns nil. So here's a quick program that demonstrates wrapping with fumped error f and unwrapping with errors unwrap. We call our file checker function with a non-existent file. We try to open the file with os open, error gets returned. We use fumped error f to wrap the error with percent %w verb, return back that error. In main, we do our nil error check, print out the returned error, and then try to access the wrapped error using the errors unwrap function. If we found something, we print it out. And when you run this program, you'll see the following output. You get the in file checker. First line is that wrapping error we created in file checker. Second line is the error returned directly from open, from OS, OS open. So you don't usually call errors unwrap directly. Instead, you use two other functions in the errors package, errors is and errors as to find a specific wrapped error. And we'll talk about those two functions in just a couple of slides. If you want to wrap an error with your custom error type, your error type needs to implement the method unwrap. Method takes in no parameters, returns an error. So here's an update to the error we defined earlier to demonstrate how this works. We add an error field to the struct and define an unwrap method that returns the value of that field. And now we can use status error to wrap existing underlying errors. So be aware, not all errors need to be wrapped. So a library can return back an error that means processing can't continue. But the error message contains implementation details that aren't ne necessary for other parts of your program. So in this situation, it's perfectly acceptable to create a brand new error, return that instead. Just understand the situation, determine what needs to be returned. So if you want to create a new error that contains the message from another error, but you don't want to wrap it, use fumped error f to create an error, but use the percent %v verb instead of percent %w. So wrapping errors is a pretty useful way to get additional information about an error, but it introduces some problems. If a sentinel error is wrapped, you can't use double equals to check for it. So Go solves this problem with two functions in the errors package, is and as. To check if the returned error or any error that it wraps matches a specific sentinel error instance, use errors is. It takes in two parameters, the error that's being checked and the instance that you're comparing against. The errors is function returns true if there's an error in the error chain that matches the provided sentinel error. So, Here's a short program to see errors is in action. So the file checker function we had before, so do the same thing. Um, and then back in main, we use errors is to check to see if that returned error chain includes OS error not exist. And because OS error not, not exist is in the error chain, running this program produces the output that file doesn't exist. If we use the double equals, we wouldn't see that printed out because the sentinel error is wrapped inside of our own error message. So by default, errors is uses double equals to compare each wrapped error with a, spec with a specified error. But this might not actually work for all the error types that you define. So Go has the concept of a non-comparable type. A type in Go is non-comparable if it's a slice, a map, a function, a channel, or a struct that contains one of those types. So in those cases, you have to use, implement the is method on your error. In this case, our my error struct has a field that's a slice of ints. And slices aren't comparable, so we, to, we can't use is with this type unless we define the is method, which takes an error as a parameter, returns true or false. So what we see in this code, we're taking advantage of a type assertion and the comma OK um, idiom to see if a passed an error is a type by error. We didn't talk about those earlier. So if it's confusing, you didn't see it before. Um, if it is, we use a function deep equal in the reflect package, which can really check if two things are identical. And if the pass an error isn't a my error, we just return false. The errors as function allows you to check if a returned error or any error that it wraps matches, matches a specific type. It takes in two parameters. The first is the error being examined. The second is a pointer to a variable of the type that you are looking for. If the function returns true, an error in the error chain was found that matched, that matching error is assigned to the second parameter. If the function returns false, no match was found in the error chain. And this is what it looks like to use this with my error. So we declare a variable my error of uh, my error, my error type. 
set to the zero value. You then pass a pointer to that variable into errors as. So you don't have to pass a pointer to a variable of error type as the second parameter to errors as. You can pass a pointer to an interface to find an error that meets an interface. Here we're using an anonymous interface. Just like, just like you can declare functions in line, you can declare interfaces in line as well. But any interface type is perfectly fine. If the second parameter to errors is though, is anything besides a pointer to an error or a pointer to an interface, you get a panic, your program just crashes. And just like, just like you can override the default errors is comparison with an is method, you can override the default errors as comparison with an as method on your error. But implementing as is non-trivial, requires a lot of reflection. You really only do it in very unusual circumstances. Like you want to match an error of one type or return an error of a different type. So just to be clear, when do you use is and when do you use as? Use errors is when you're looking for a specific instance or specific values. And use errors as when you're looking for a specific type. And by default, Go doesn't provide a way to get a stack trace to an error. And we've shown you can use error wrapping to kind of build a call stack by hand, but that's not always what you want. However, there are third-party libraries with error types that generate those stack traces for you automatically. And the best known third-party libraries from Dave Cheney, there's that name again, uh, github.com pkg errors, and it provides functions for wrapping errors with stack traces. By default, the stack trace won't be printed out. So if you want to see the stack trace, use fumped printf and the verbose output verb, which is called percent plus, w, percent plus v. And you check the documentation on that package to learn more. So thanks very much for your time. Hope everyone here learned a little bit about Go, a lot about errors. Uh, here's the link to get 30-day access to learning Go. Um, and some lucky winners will get copies of the book. Uh, let's, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I have one. Um, so um, uh, how quickly and easily would it take for someone to build a fully featured REST API in Go if I had to get one uh, made as soon as possible? Um, it's pretty quick. So you saw the H, so the, what I, <clears throat> the example I show for the hello world, um, it, we didn't use, we use a built-in server that's built into the standard library. You shouldn't use that. You should actually create your own server instance, but HTTP server is a type in the HTTP package. You can specify your handlers on that. Um, there's third-party libraries, there's Mux, there's Chi, there's other ones that give you more complicated ways to register your routes. So you can specify, here's a route that has um, uh, the response on a get or a post or a put or a delete and has placeholder variables that are in the string. And you then give it a handler function, which has a request and a response as parameters into it. And you read and write to those. And so if incoming requests come in and have JSON in them, you can decode the JSON there and then just call your business logic after that. Um, so it's, it's very simple. It's all built into it and it's really fast. Um, Go compiles native performance is about on par with Java, about half the speed of C or C++ usually. Um, way, way, way faster than Python or JavaScript or Ruby. Um, and you get these very small binaries out of it. So you get like a 10 meg binary. Another thing I didn't mention though is Go's memory usage is very efficient. So it's usually about 10 times better than the equivalent Java program. So again, if you're running a Docker container, you're running a Kubernetes cluster, you want to pack as many containers as possible into the same machine. Go is kind of nice for using not a lot of memory to do that in. Um, that answer your question, Alex? Uh, yes. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, any other question? So we, we, we don't have any questions at the moment, but I, I just wanted to touch upon a couple of things we were talking about before everyone got here. So can you, um, I know you mentioned servers as being a good use case for Go. Um, what have you seen in the wild? Like, like what are the most common use cases for Go today? So Other than just the microservices. Sure. Um, so Docker is written in Go. Kubernetes is written in Go. Um, any of the HashiCorp things, Vault or Console, they're all written in Go. Um, most companies that are doing microservices are probably, a lot of them are now switching over to Go to write those microservices in for, for the reasons I said. Um, what's interesting is that when they first created Go, Rob Pike and Ken Thompson assumed that C++ developers like them were the ones who'd adopt it. And it turned out that was not the case at all. It turned out to actually be Python and Ruby developers and some Node developers. I think the guy who actually created Node is now a Go developer. He said, don't use Node, use Go. Um, you know. 
uh, it was kind of a funny interview where he said that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's people who are building these web services and wanted something because, because Go is type safe, but still has the type inference available and has the shorter syntax. It's a very nice way to write things, a lot less verbose in some other languages for, for creating these things. Um, command line tools are great in Go also. Um, people write command line tools in Python. You got to bring over Python with you and make sure everyone's running the same version of Python because Go is a single binary. It's easy to do and just have that one binary on your, on your um, computer that you're distributing. Cross compiling in Go. So people say, oh, it's compiled natively. How do you handle different platforms? That's what virtual machines are for. But cross compiling in Go is literally setting two environment variables and saying, go build. You set Go, go OS and Go Arch and, and then say, go build. And it builds the binary for another platform for you. It's slick. The, the compiler's written in Go, so it can do this. Um, and there are a couple of gotchas. If you're using Go, has a library called C Go to bridge to C code if you have to use it. You obviously can't cross compile that because it's not going to exist. Um, but anything that's pure Go code can be trivially cross compiled um, to make, which is nice. People who have, who have a new Macs that are running Apple Silicon, they're running ARM chips, you can compile stuff to run on x86 easily, or you can distribute binaries for other people as well. Mac to Linux or Windows. Yeah, and and um, I can definitely um, uh, back you up on the whole small binaries and memory thing. Uh, like, I mean, you can, in my experience, our binaries are so tiny. Um, I mean, especially if you build it with an Alpine um, Linux base, yeah. and then you Docker mm -hmm. base, and then you put the Go binary on top of it, it's like so tiny compared to Java. And or Spring especially, um, so it's definitely mm -hmm. um, you can pack a lot of the services into an EC2 instance, like um, or 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 a, a cube node. So definitely, uh, I concur with that. Um, we also touched upon uh, libraries versus framework. So typically, when it comes to Java, Spring, uh, even uh, people think of okay, what framework should I use? Or even Python or Ruby, we think mm -hmm. about like. Um, so you had touched upon like the, so can, can you kind of revisit that real quick? Sure. So um, Go is, Go does not like frameworks. Um, there's a, Go, Go favors libraries over frameworks. And I explained this earlier, I'll explain it again for people who weren't around earlier. Um, difference is subtle between a framework and a library, but the way I usually describe it is you call a library that a framework calls you. So library provides functionality. Like I want to, I want to, you know, unmarshal some JSON. So I call the JSON library. Um, but for Spring, for example, Spring's a framework, right? You're writing your code, you tag your code, so that Spring can call into your code to do stuff, which is great, but it's not very composable. Because if there are two frameworks that have to work together, usually, you know, Spring has ten thousand integrations with other platforms as well, right? It's like, oh, Spring supports X, now it's great. But trying to glue them together behind the scenes to make those things happen automatically can be a little tricky, right? Um, and so frameworks usually get integrated because their authors talk to each other, whereas libraries are composable because they exchange, they, the library says, this is the data I take in, this is the data I, that comes out of me. I can then take that data that comes out and reformat it for something else, pass it on to another library. So it, again, it's seeing these small parts you can plug together, which longer term tends out to be a better way to build code. Go, go the people who develop Go, they're thinking about the, the dozens of developers over dozens of years. How do you maintain software? What's that going to be like? And so that's why you have you just have three you have three um, control structures, right? You don't have a separate control structure for exception handling. You don't have, you know, you look at like Swift. Swift is I've been learning Swift a little bit, and it has every feature, right? Like every new release of Swift is adding more stuff in, and it's it's great that Swift has all these things, but it's a lot, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's it can be hard, but. It, and Scala has shown that where Scala has added features over time, it becomes really hard to maintain your Scala code. There's breakage between like dot versions in Scala. Go has a compatibility guarantee where it's, um, any Go program that was written earlier, back to Go 1.0 being released in 2011, still compiles today. Um, new features get added in, but they always have to be added in a backwards compatible way. And any, the, the standard library as well has been, has they have a compatibility guarantee. They won't introduce any breaking change to the, to the standard library so that old code can still compile unless they find a security bug. That's like their one exception they'll make is if they find something that's a security issue, they will go back and fix it. That has happened very rarely where they had a breaking change for security. Yeah, um, so Tosh just mentioned that he found like file operations to be incredibly fast with Go, especially when you use Go routines to kind of um, recursively crawl through your um, drives. 
So um, definitely, I, I mean, I have noticed the same thing. So yeah, yeah, any kind of command line tool, especially on Linux or Mac OS, like uh, Go is definitely so powerful and so uh, fast and efficient at, at doing that. Um, any comments about? I mean, you mentioned that, but uh, have you seen, seen that too? Sure. This this is this, again. This this is intentional. So so Go routines. I said the Go routines are like threads, and that was a little bit of a lie, just to get through my thirty minute talk. Um, so a Go routine. So what Go does? Threads are operating system level resources. Go routines are, are process level resources. They're lightweight threads. Um, and what happens at startup? Go. You, you specify the number of threads that Go will grab. Usually, it's a twice the number of CPUs, and Go grabs them at startup time. And then there's a scheduler inside of the Go runtime that's embedded into every Go application. And it's like a couple, it's a, not, it's a couple of meg runtime, not very big. Um, and it does the scheduling itself. So that way, if something is blocking in file IO, it knows that. And so it can, it can deschedule that and, and wait for the, the IO to stop blocking and schedule different Go routine at the same time. And the GC is also aware of, of what's going on and can sit there and steal work from other threads as well and, and get scheduled across. So everything is tied together really, and the network connection is the same thing, network polling, again, tied into the, to that same scheduler. So all these things are designed to just work together and give this nice, quick, even feel. And so you're not stuck trying to handle these things. You can, you can launch tens of thousands of Go routines at once inside your program. I, I promise you, if you launch tens of thousands of threads in a Java program, it will fall over. Until So Java actually has caught onto this. So there's a thing called Project Loom going on for Java right now, which is trying to bring the Go model of Go routines to Java. And that's yeah. going to come eventually. I don't think it's in 17. I think it's coming after it. But the, the, the wisdom of this has been shown. Yeah, de yeah, definitely. I think um, one of the things I wish Java did as they add more features on one end, I wish they would really go back and start removing, like, why, why are we still supporting stuff from late 90s? I, I, I don't get it. But that's, yes. <laughs> that's another talk. Yes. Um, so Darcy is asking us about, um, what are some popular or common libraries um, that people programming in Go use? Um, so he was giving an example of logging is something that's available in Python um, as a library. So, um, and we covered a little bit about that, but can you, can, what, what, what have you seen, John? So, so logging is actually a good one to talk about, actually. So Go has a logger in the standard library. It's not great. Um, most people don't really use it there. Most people don't really use it. Um, Uber, created, so there's the one called Loggers that has been popular for many years. It works pretty well. There's another one that was created by Uber called Zap, which is very, very fast. And so one of the things, so again, because so I was mentioned before, Go being garbage collected and Go has pointers and Go has value types, which is a little unusual for languages to have all three of those things going on at the same time. But what that lets you do is you're actually able to avoid allocating things on the heap in Go by being careful with your value types. Because value types, when you pass a value type to a, to a a function, it's a copy of it that stays in the stack. And I, that, my book covers this in more detail. But you can write zero, and the less work your garbage collector does, the better it is, because it's just not doing stuff. Um, so yeah. keeps your programs much faster. And so um, the so Zap is very proud of how few allocations it actually has when it does your logging for you. Yeah, and we mentioned the Gorilla Mux earlier yep. for routing. That's a good library um, that I've used. and. Um, she is the other one which I use a lot for routing as well. She, yeah. Go, go dash chi, yeah. yeah. And um, also the package errors we mentioned uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Dave Cheney is a, a error library. Uh, I have been looking at something called emp error. Um, I haven't really played with it much, but it looks like a superset of um, Dave Cheney's work and some other work there. Okay. So they're they're all good options to look at. Yep. I've written a couple too that no one uses besides me that are, that will um, wrap that'll, that'll generate a stack trace or let you have have if say for example doing a validation you wanted to have, return back multiple errors at the same time it's not a, it's not an error chain they're all at the same level so I've got a multi error that takes that makes a slice of error work like a single error. Oh, that's a good idea. So yeah. one thing um, we want to quickly talk about is testing because uh, usually people pull in a library to do testing but we don't have to do that do that with Go right. You do not. Um, yeah, so there's a whole chapter in book on testing. So Go includes testing as part of the standard library. Um, and unit testing, code coverage, benchmarking, and actually a profiler as well that will spit out a graphical representation of where your code is slow is all bundled for free as part of your application. And they're, they're going to add fuzzing in the fall. 
So if you're familiar with fuzzing, where you sit there and send randomized data into your program to see if you, any of your conditions are wrong. So you can usually image images with binary data is often used for fuzzing. Use the fuzzing to find errors. So they're adding fuzzing as well to the standard um, library out of the box. So it's it's great. Again, it, there's a there's no there's a there's a go test tool that's bundled with it, and test has cover and has profiling as well. Uh, but language wise, you just write functions whose the first word in the function is test or benchmark, and it runs a test or it runs a benchmark. And rather than adding it lots of syntax and stuff with it's just regular standard go code. So there's no assertion library. People usually don't use assertion libraries, they use an if statement again, because you can, it's there, but they do exist. There are, there are assertion libraries. Yeah, and there's an option in the package to, um, um, to also get coverage. So it does coverage reports uh, that then you can feed into your CI CD tools to do uh, the coverage as well. So it's really, an, so definitely uh, check out the testing package. All right, yep. so Darcy is saying, on, so the, John is fluent in many languages. I, I, some are paged <laughs> in. Oh, oh, okay. that's, that's actually what's to say what I do. Um, so it, it's like, it's, it's like demand paging more than anything else. Right now, Go is in most, most of my brain right now is Go, but if I have to drop into Python for some time, it'll take me a couple of days to relearn to like most, some of Python's in my head, but I forget some details and libraries and things. I'm like, okay, back to Python. Same thing with Java. Okay, okay, I've relearned some Java stuff. Um, I, I, I've used dozens in my career. <laughs> um, what are some challenges for learning new languages? Um, so the, the nice thing is they're all kind of the same in a lot of ways, right? Oh, there's, so there, there's basically two classes of languages. There's, there's Lispy languages and there's Algol languages. I think that's, that's really where the world has kind of come down on. And so if you've learned C and you've learned Java, you've learned, they're the same. They may have objects, but the same basic structure if you're putting a procedural way of describing things. They all have more or less the same syntax for breaking up your structures and breaking up your code and writing your functions. Maybe the parameters are in reverse. Maybe in, in Go, you put the variable name first. In Java, you put the type first, but your IDE catches you when your fingers are doing the wrong thing. Um, it's the idioms of the language that really make the difference, right? There's just certain ways you write code in Go. And you can tell, like when someone's, like, someone's it took me a long time to do this too. I, I wrote in Java for most of my time, for about 20 years. And I would try to, I was like, how do I get this thing? I know how to do this in Java. Let me write this code in Go. And you start doing these things that you just feel like you just tell this person's a Java developer. It's like when someone, when someone speaks, if someone has English as a second language, you can kind of guess what their first language is, not by the accent, by the words that aren't quite the same between the languages and the things that don't exist, whether it's articles or gendering nouns or something that's a little bit different between the languages, you catch it. It's the same thing with programming languages. Um, they're much easier than human languages. I'm terrible at human languages. Um, so yeah, it's, it's keep, it, keep the short version in your head and then you can go back and look up the details later. Um, Golang versus Rust. Uh, I think it's peaceful coexistence, to be honest. Um, they, they, they solve different problems. Uh, Rust is one of those things I, I, I do not know Rust. I, I, I keep on poking my head in tutorials and never actually get very far in it because I, I haven't needed it, but I know people who do it and love it. Um, Rust is fast. Rust is safe. Um, those are really important qualities for some kinds of code. Um, I, I really expect, so Linux has started adding Rust library support. I really think the day will come when we'll see an OS written in Rust because it makes sense. Like them doing that for a browser was a great idea for safety. Um, but the um, th rewriting our tools in Rust makes a lot of sense. Like all these things that people are, are Rust also has, will expose like, like a C library. So again, we could even do C go to, into Rust libraries at some point. But things like image magic should all be rewritten in Rust. Anything that touches any data that anyone ever pulls off of a wire, everything should be in Rust because I don't want another stack smashed to, to break my programs and break my environments and, have, and let me be compromised. But on the other hand, Go is a lot easier to write. And most of the time, the kind of speed you get from Rust, you don't really need. Because um, if you're talking over a network, that network's a million times slower than your CPU. So optimizing to get the, the, to get it twice as fast when you have this million time overhead on the network call probably doesn't save you any time. Um, other Lispy languages. So the most obvious one's Clojure, which runs on top of the JVM. That Clojure, which Chicky did Clojure. Um, it, it's pretty popular. Yeah. Uh, that, that's probably the most popular Lispy language in existence right now that people use. Um, 
And if anyone does AutoCAD, AutoCAD still uses Lisp as its scripting language, and Emacs uses Lisp as its scripting language. They're not Lisp lists. Uh, schemes are still out there. Rackets out there. Oh, yeah, F sharp and OCaml. Those are more functional. Those are, I guess, a third category of language I should have mentioned too. Is the functional languages. Um, but I, I don't do functional languages very much because, you know. <laughs> I, 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 you know. Go, uh, Go also has like first, uh, it's, we wouldn't call it functional, just like we wouldn't call it object oriented, but it does support, you can pass functions, it has closures, um, it, it yep. does, it, it, you can return functions, you can, you know, use anonymous functions, all that stuff you're used to is available in Go as well. Yep, so. absolutely. So yeah, you have the, uh, um, yeah, Go, to, Go doesn't have the immutability that functional languages do. That's, that's Functional languages have really taught us the value of immutability, I think more than almost anything else. And that mutating your parameters is almost always a bad idea. You see it in Go in a bunch of cases because Go didn't have generics. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to say JSON unmarshal some, some data off of the wire into a struct, how do I specify what struct type they're talking about? I can't return it back. I have to pass something in. Um, and sometimes passing it in actually Again, if you want to like save memory access, you know what you're doing, that I'm reusing a variable over. If I'm reading a whole bunch of JSON off the wire and I want to have to keep on reallocating over and over again, it's handy to use that exact same storage for it over and over again. But you're being very consciously aware that you're reusing memory and not being immutable. Functional languages say just always be immutable. Don't, mm -hmm. don't think about it. Don't have side effects. That's the whole monad thing, right? I'm trying to capture the side effect, um, which is some people can think that way. Um, and God bless them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any more questions? 